Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. Book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. Our lesson will be out of verse 25. We'll begin reading with verse number 22. Hebrews 10, 22. Our lesson is the approaching day. There are several positive things that are given us first. Verse 22, let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. Verse 24, let us consider one another. But then the first word in verse number 25 is a negative. So we immediately go to a negative after we have had all these positive things. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting, not forsaking, but exhorting, warning, urging, encouraging, but exhorting one another and increase that, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. <clears throat> For if we sin willfully, what willful sin are we talking about? Forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. It is impossible for those who have been once enlightened if they fall away to renew them again. <clears throat> Willful sin is walking away from that which you professed was the Word of God. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth will separate you from immorality. But the knowledge of the truth will not bring you into righteousness except it be made effectual by the Holy Ghost. Rece have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Who are the adversaries? Those who have walked away from that which they said was the revelation of Christ to their souls. In the Old Testament, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. But we're not under Moses. Grace and truth has come now by Jesus Christ. So is Moses greater than Christ? No, Christ is greater than Moses. Then let me ask you the question of how much sore Punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy clean, excuse me, as an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. We already had it mentioned this morning, resisting and quenching and denying the Spirit of God. Here it is, despising the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, 
we have read in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 36, the Lord shall judge his people. I want you to know it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let us draw near into the new way and the living way that has been consecrated, set apart for us through the veil of his torn flesh and enter into the holy place by our high priest. Let us hold fast to this, never letting it go. We can hold fast to it because he is faithful that has promised. He does not, he cannot, he will not ever go back on his word. You can affix your eternal soul to that which God has revealed to you of Jesus Christ. And then let us consider one another that while we are an entity ourselves within the body of Christ, living stones, we are his bone and his flesh, we are living organism of ourselves, yet we are not alone. And let us continue to let, as it were, the blood that flows through our various parts of our body to give nurture to it all. Let us allow unrestricted the flow of the love of God through us to others that we might all benefit and come boldly to the throne as a unit. And then being that we have all these great and precious promises, let us never consider forsaking assembling together with Christ and his people. If we say that we have been born again by grace alone and we have benefited from the revelation of Jesus Christ and the impartation of his righteousness as God hath made him to be sin for us and he hath come in the likeness of sinful flesh. Let us never ever go back on that. No matter how, no matter how much the world threatens us or no matter how long God leaves you and me on this earth, may we never get tired of the old, old story. Amen. May we always want to hear that which we've always known. But as God extends it for us, and has done so already today, extends for us things that we do not know. I don't know about you, but exhausting the Bible is nothing at all that I've ever considered. <laughs> Study the scriptures. In, in, delve into them like a man going into a mine trying to dig out gold and the precious metals of the earth Solomon said seek wisdom like that but I've never thought that I would ever exhaust what is the mother load the main vein of God I the more I read and study the more I realize there's more to be known and how little I used to know it never gets old so there's one negative thing how do we overcome this thing not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together we have example of some that has already done it as the manner of some is we look at those who have already done it and we say they have not prospered they have walked away they have become a, a, a blotch on the testimony of Jesus Christ they have forsaken the Lord and his people. I'm talking about walking away from faith, dear soul. Or professed faith. So we consider those who have already done it. And then those who have not done it. That are still here. We exhort them. We encourage them by that which encourages us. We had two meals Wednesday night after service. 
Captain D brought us out some fish. And Brother Gary began, as his cup runneth over, to tell us about Adam. So we had what they used to call previews of coming attractions. He couldn't hold it back. If God gives it to you, he doesn't give it to you exclusively for you. He gives it to you to flow through you to others. That's how you keep the body of water from becoming stagnant. You let the flow continue. Yes, sir. There's a little old tiny pond down there in Tyrone, Georgia. And they built a walking path around it and a bridge, a wooden bridge over the neck of it so you could go on across it. They put a great big old pump on the bank, huge thing. Encased it in steel, fixed it so nobody could mess with it. And they ran long pipes out on the right side of the bridge in the neck of the lake the pond. And then one out into the very middle and put a fountain there that shoots water straight up into the air. It just bubbles over here on the right side, but it shoots it up in the air on the, out in the middle. Why did they do that? To oxygen, say the word. Oxygen. What Brother Ed just said. To make oxygen mix with the water so it would not get stagnant. Dear soul, if you got something in you, you want to put a pump in your heart and you want to spread it up into the air and tell everybody about it. Two different brothers came and sat down with me at the breakfast table this past week and neither one of them want to talk about biscuit and gravy. Thank the Lord. Because I didn't get any. <clears throat> but they wanted to talk about the Lord and what God had showed them. You know what? That started my fire burning, so I had to tell them what I saw about the Lord. And we had fellowship with bread that the world does not know, Brother Jamie. It wasn't the leaven of, leaven of the Pharisees. It was the doctrine of God. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life in him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life. In other words, those who continually require the sustenance from God, that is the very living Savior Jesus Christ himself, we must live off of him as we physically live off of natural food. We set ourselves down for three meals a day plus snacks. to sustain our physical bodies. And the Lord provided it that way for us to be able to understand that's how we spiritually have to be nourished from the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's something else. There are those positive things. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. Let us consider one another. Then there's the negative thing, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together because you have negative examples as the manner of some is. And how do we do it? How do we maintain a faithful assembly down through our lives? By enjoying, exhorting one another. There is... A spiritual excitement, joy, satisfaction, and a realm of living when you're given something from God and you have the blessed Holy Spirit's opportunity to share it with others. It is truly more blessed to give than to receive. It is a wonderful thing. So exhorting one another helps you not forsake the assembling of yourselves together because you have seen others who have done so as the manner of some is. And guess what? Now they can't exhort you anymore. They can't edify you anymore. They're going to dry up on the vine if they can't find somebody to exhort because the flow 
of the Spirit of God comes through the root, Christ, the root and offspring of David. As the sap rises in the plant or in the tree, so the Spirit of God rises from Jesus Christ. It permeates the trunk and the limbs, and it goes out to provide the leaves and then the fruit. But if you cut off that flow, we shall cast them forth as a branch into the fire. Dead. Twice dead. Number one, they're dead because they don't produce any fruit. Number two, they're dead because God plucks them up by the roots. Man's been working on a big old oak tree on Tyrone Road for months now. He's just wearing out his chainsaw and, and his wood splitter trying to get that great big old huge tree split. Why? It died. The wind blew it over. And he's got to clean it up now, right out there on the road. He still hasn't got it all done. I don't want to be a dead tree laying beside the road. I don't care what kind of plant I am. I want to be a living plant. I want to be able to produce fruit to the glory of God, not for the glory of myself or say stuck in my thumb and pulled out a plum and said, oh, what a good boy am I. I want the Lord God to be glorified by it and the church to be edified by it. Exhorting one another. It is a great deterrent of failing to assemble ourselves together. Now, why? So much the more. It is to increase. Exhorting is to increase. What Brother Gary didn't get around to saying, and I know he'd like to come back up here and say some more because you always leave out something and you never get to everything. Brother Gary, you can't preach a whole Bible in one whack. I found that out. Some people think I try, but anyhow, I don't think that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I do. Brother Gary was telling us how that that message started years ago down in Waycross, Georgia with one thing one brother said to him. And it took years for a second voice to come and say something along the same line. Why hadn't he forgot that first thing that first man said? Why hadn't he forgot after all the years of involvement with family and life and paying taxes and going to doctors and worrying about, you know, test results and uh, having to buy a new car and, and, and people in his family being sick? Why hadn't he forgot that first little sentence and phrase that that first man said? Years later, second man comes, gives him another little phrase, and he takes that piece of the jigsaw puzzle and puts it together. And he says, you know what? There's something of the Lord in this. And like a good bloodhound, he stays on the trail, and he keeps on looking until finally God opens it up. So much the more. If you get into, I don't know the word, I'm going to use a word you probably ain't going to like. If you get into the science of exaltation, if you get into the spirit of exhorting, you will never, ever, ever be able to get out of it, and it will always be so much the more. What Brother Gary has brought and what Brother Jamie brought this morning is ours now, and we'll build on it. And it will open up more. That's the way it is. And one thing we know by Brother Gary, don't ever offer a deal to Bob Feather. <laughs> and so much the more. It's going to increase. The decreasing of, of the opportunity to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Where did that start? Well, it, it was, uh, it's like that seed. It didn't fall into good ground. There have been people that got in that started looking immediately for a way out. And usually they blame either the church or the preacher. Some of them will blame God. But they're looking for the preacher to say one thing. They will make a man an offender for a word. That's Bible. 
As soon as he says that word, that's how I got thrown out of a primitive Baptist church. I made one little phrase. And the next time I went up there, as they summoned me back to preach, the deacons met me at the door and threw me out because of one little phrase. And I said, well, thank God. It's a long way up here. And I didn't know what I was doing here anyhow. I didn't mean to offend, didn't know I was, didn't know that that bothered anybody, had said that same phrase hundreds of times. But I got thrown out because one little phrase. Some people, when they come in, are looking for a way out. You can't imagine that everybody that shakes your hand and says, Good morning, honey, is really a child of God. So how do we destroy anything that has any semblance of wanting to get out and justify ourselves in doing so by making somebody else the blame. Exhorting more. How? As you see the day approaching. What day is this? Well, it's Sunday, you knucklehead. No, I mean, what day is this in the Bible? Some have said it was these Hebrew Christians looking for the day of the Roman invasion into Jerusalem to destroy it in 70 AD. <coughs> I can't throw that out. Some have said, well, they're looking for the day of their death, physical death. Okay. But I've always looked at it as the day of the coming of the Lord. The approaching day. But you say, I got problems with that. How can we see the day approaching when Jesus says things like Matthew 24? If you got any bubblegum wrappers left from Gary's bookmark and you can use it for this and, and put it over around Matthew 24, 25. You say in Matthew 24, Verse number 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, ye know that it is near, even at the doors. What is he talking about? Verse 30. Seeing the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There are evidences of these things we were going to look at and we will hopefully in a, in a while look at no man knows the day or the hour. In fact, look at verse 36 of Matthew 24. Heaven and earth, verse 35, shall pass away but my word shall not pass away. You can depend on both things. You can depend on one thing passing away, but you can depend on the other thing not ever passing away. Now, when will heaven pass away? But of that day and hour, specific exact time of its occurrence, knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But then, in verse 37, he talks about the days of Noah giving you an opportunity to know the approaching day of the coming of the Lord. So we say, I want to be not just status quo as we see faith diminishing on the earth, 
When the Son of Man cometh, Jesus asked, shall he find faith on the earth? We want to consider one another. We want to hold fast. We want to draw near. We don't want to forsake the assembly of ourselves together as we see some begin to do. If we had every person who had ever been a member of this church in the last 40 years, we couldn't see them in this auditorium. So we, we know that there's something that will encourage and enthuse us. Pay Bob $50 to get in front of him so you can get up and give something that's just about to bust. Exhorting one another, encouraged, enthused. Man ain't going nowhere. He needs you to be able to milk the cow. You don't know what I'm talking about, do you? If you don't make that milk that cow as needful, she get in trouble. Her bag will burst. You got to give them an outlet. So exhorting one another, and and and, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Then there must be within the revelation of gospel manifestation even if it's subordinate, an awareness of the place that we are in time. Hold your place. 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse 11. First Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen unto them, the people in the Old Testament caught, coming out of Egypt, going through the Red Sea and all that, and, and, and winding around, and wandering around in the wilderness. Now all these things happen unto them for our examples. And they are written for our admonition. Finish the verse for me, please. Upon whom the ends of the world are So I understand that no man knows the day nor the hour. I would never get into that, setting a date and a time. But I would admonish you and try to do it so much the more to enhance our staying in the faith and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the Lord begins to impress upon us to give you an understanding that there will be an end. It's not going to be done by Russia. It's not going to be done by a nuclear explosion because two men will still be in the bed and two women will still be in the field. Commerce will still be going on. It'll be night somewhere and peaceful enough for... You ever had to sleep with your brother? Lord have mercy. Wake up with a toe up your nose. <laughs> Two in the bed. Two in the field. The Lord's in control of this thing, folks. Amen. I don't care what South is say. I, God's, God is correct and he is a scientific that's stupid to finish that sentence he's the great scientist but they don't tell me when the world's going to come to an end I don't care about that day and hour but I do care about discerning the sky and knowing the times and the signs of Christ's coming by the Holy Spirit. And I understand that it's not connected to Mr. Schofield's seven points that he has of the coming tribulation period. We've been in the tribulation ever since Cain killed Abel. And dear soul, the Bible said that when the cross was made effectual by the coming of the Holy Ghost, we came into the ends of the world. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 2. For unto the angels, Hebrews 2, 5. For the, unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. What world to come was he talking about? Well, you stand here in 2018, you say, well, that means the end of the world and when time is no more. No, you got to go back there where he was standing and say it means the coming of the messianic kingdom. Because he's already mentioned it in Hebrews 1.3. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. When did the world, end of the world come? When he had by himself purged our sins. It started at the cross. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 5. What did he say? He said Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 5. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I've swallowed so much pollen I sound like a, I don't know. <laughs> It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, verse 4, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they fall away to renew them again. What powers of the world to come? The messianic kingdom. He was talking to Hebrew Christians that knew the law, understood Moses, and now they were coming to see the Messiah's kingdom. One of them, who was a representative man, stood there and cried as if a man standing on a cliff, he couldn't make another step. He would fall down into the abyss. His name was John. What was he doing? He was weeping. weeping. Why? Because he couldn't find nobody under the law that's worthy to come and open up the book and lead us on into the world to come, the messianic kingdom, the gospel age. But then he saw the Lamb as he had been slain come and take the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne and everybody that had breath started saying glory to God and the lamb forever for thou hast redeemed us by thy blood taking us out of every people and nation and kindred and tongue and the world to come the one you live in the one we don't really give as much Praise to God for as we should. We take it for granted. You do not ever want to go back and live under the law. I don't care how glorious Solomon was. I don't care what all happened and the miracles that went under Elijah and Elisha and all of that kind of stuff. You do not want to go back. Paul called them weak and beggarly elements and he was under both. You're living... In the glorious age of the world to come, we are those upon whom the ends of the world have come. So, no, I do not want to deal with the day nor the hour, but I do not want to be without the impression of the Spirit of God upon our souls to make us understand that we're deep into the second age that was the world to come. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Verse number 11. And that knowing the time, you see, you're supposed to know it. Brother Jamie, didn't you, didn't you read us in, what was it, uh, John 16? Was that John 16 where they said, he said, you guys can tell me about the weather, whether I should take an umbrella, but you can't tell me what, where we are in the scheme of things with God. And it says here, knowing the time, we need to understand where we are. 
and that knowing the time, that now, and that was 2,000 years ago, it is high time to wake out of sleep. Why? Because our complete and full salvation. That's not talking about justification. Well, my little boy just got saved. He, he finally came to salvation. We ain't talking about the individual justification. We're talking about the full and complete glorification of all the church at the second coming of the Lord. Right. Amen. For now is our full and complete and eternal salvation nearer than when we believed. Listen at verse 12. The night, that is the Old Testament days, People sat in darkness, and now the light has come. That's what it says in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, I think. Maybe 3. You can look it up. They have seen a great light. The night is far spent. That's the Old Testament. The day is at hand. That's the New Testament age. That's the gospel age. Let us... Next word. Therefore... Therefore Cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly. How? If you don't know the time, how can you walk honestly? You got to know that it's day. It's not the old darkness anymore. The understanding of where we are will have an effect upon who you are. There was a good and faithful servant. There was a wicked and slothful servant. One was good, that was his heart. The other was wicked, that was his heart. So the one who was good, had a good heart, was faithful. He brought everything that was necessary out of the storehouse and fed all the household. Took care of them until the master come back. The other one was wicked, and his was slothful, lazy. He didn't care whether you had a thing to eat or not. He just wanted to benefit himself because he had the key to the meat house. And do you know what the difference, the only said difference there was between what made one wicked and the other one good? The wicked servant said, My Lord delayeth his coming. That's it. That's all you can find. My Lord delayeth his coming. Just like those people who change the image of God wind up in debauchery. Read Romans chapter 1. All the way down to ungodliness like you wouldn't believe. If you change the image of God, beings that we are made in God's image, you have just Lord, your standard of the image of yourself and God will give you up and give you over, it says, to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. Men lying with men and women with women. Where do we get all this mess? Because we change the image of God. What you know and believe about God will affect you. My Lord delayeth His coming. So He was... He was labeled as a wicked, that's his heart, and slothful, that's his actions. For as a man, whatever a man is in his heart, that's what he'll do. He was a wicked and slothful servant just for the one reason. He put the coming of Christ out of his mind. And he began to beat the other servants. Hmm. Dear soul, the reason that America is in the mess she's in is not due to the White House. It's due to the church house. Yeah, that's right. I ain't saying the White House ain't in a mess, but I'm saying the cause and the source of America's ungodliness is the church house. We don't want to hear that again. One group's over here singing, tell me the old, old story. It's new every time I hear it. There's nothing new to be said. If it's new, it's not true. 
The other group's saying, I'm tired of that old gospel. Let's do something different. Let's throw the pulpit out and make a stage up here. And let's bring in actors. Amen. Let's bring in televisions and speakers. Have you ever noticed how we don't go to hear preachers anymore? We go to hear speakers. Uh, our relationship to the person of God will determine our relationship to sin and evil and hell and Satan or our relationship to Jesus Christ and righteousness and the performance of edification and so much the more as you see the day of coming, the day approaching. The approaching day, folks, is coming. It's nearer than it was yesterday. It's nearer than when you first believed. The ends of the world have come upon us. You are going to be fastly propelled into the presence of God Almighty. You young people, wake up. You think old age is a disease you ain't going to catch. But guess what? Let's go get your baby book out. Can you still put your toe in your mouth? <laughs> yeah. Well, there you are in your baby book doing it. Dear soul, listen. Your life can go by you so fast you can't even believe how you got here. It goes by fast. It's unbelievable. The day is approaching. So he says in Romans 13, verse 12, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us therefore, I'm going to put that in, put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Because it said that servant who was wicked and was beating the other servants just for one thing. <laughs> He said the Lord delays his coming. He put off the coming of his own responsibility to give an account far from him. And the Lord came in an hour when he thought not and he cut him asunder and cast him into outer darkness. And there ain't no lawyers in hell to try to get you a reprieve. You only got one lawyer and that's Jesus Christ. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous if you're going to do something about the coming day you better do it right now yeah. Amen. well brother Gene you don't know about the day and the hour I, I, I'm telling you that I don't James chapter 5 but I know something about the days of Noah Peter talks about the elements melting with fervent heat and he said seeing all these things are going to be what manner of persons ought you to be the awareness of the coming of the Lord will affect your spiritual purity or impurity if you don't believe in it you'll become a evil and evil and wicked servant but if you do understand that you will soon in your death <coughs> Or in his coming and you don't know when that's gonna be you will become a good and faithful servant why because you have a desire to exhort others and exhorting others builds you up and causes you not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together James chapter 5 verse 8 be ye also patient like the farmers patient for the fruit of the earth establish your hearts can you tell me why <coughs> you're not going to work on your patience you will not establish your heart except 
in the awareness of the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you put it far from you, and you've got your little calendar in your iPhone, and it says, beep, you got to go do this on a certain day. And you got all that stuff laid out. You better put that thing down, dear soul. And you better pick up your eye gospel instead of your iPhone and say, I don't know what's going to happen. I may... The Bible said, the guy said, I'm going to go into town and I'm going to go to the market and I'm going to sell and buy and do all this tomorrow. He said, don't say that. You better say, God willing. It may have been that just that one man didn't get there. Bolt of lightning struck him and he didn't make it. The market's still there. Everybody else is still buying and selling. But he should have said, Lord willing. Dear soul, it doesn't matter. You don't know whether you're going to be there or not. You say, well, I wasn't killed when those 14, who are the pro football players or pro basketball players, bus went over the cliff and killed 14 of them. It wasn't me. And, and I wasn't there when that van ran into uh, uh, the crowd in Germany yesterday and killed three people and wounded a whole. It wasn't me. But look at me and tell me you absolutely positively know without any doubt that you're going to be able to lay your head down on your pillow tonight and sleep in your own bed. You can't do it. So the admitting of that and the awareness of that in a Christian attitude will cause you to not forsake, cause you not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It will cause you to want to benefit others and exhort them. And the more you exhort them, the more you will encourage your own self. It's like a circle. It always helps you as it helps other people. And it glorifies God. The Lord said he would come again. We cannot act like he won't. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse number 7. You know what? You read it. First Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. There's a statement in the first half of that verse. The end of all things is at hand. Now, then, now there's another word in the next phrase that links that to your conduct. It's the word therefore. If you have an understanding that the end of all things is at hand, it will cause you to want to conduct yourself soberly to the world and prayerfully to God. Isn't that good? America has got itself in a place to where it denies God. You change the image of God, you come down with all kind of debauchery in, Rome, debauchery in Romans chapter 1, all the way down to homosexuality. That's where it comes from. America has put God aside and said, most of them say there ain't no such thing as God. They not only changed the image of God, they got rid of God altogether. But those that do believe in God put it far from them. There's nothing wrong with this, but I want you to understand what it's doing to you. In the latter part of the closing year, or in the first part of the new year, the boss comes around and with the calendar says, okay, pick the days you want off. Now, these old heads know what to do. They know when Labor Day is, and they know when, you know, these days off, and they can get a whole week off with only taking up four days of vacation. And they know how to do that. And, and we're forced to do that. And you know that that place where you love to go on vacation, it gets so jam-packed, if you don't make the 
reservation when you check in this year, you ain't going to be able to get in there next year. I understand that. But that's having an effect on us. Okay, we're going on vacation this year. And they're going to have a place for us because we made it last year. It works. I understand that. But can you promise yourself when you stand there at that desk and give them your credit card to pray, pay for your vacation this year and they start penciling in you for next year, can you promise yourself or that clerk that you will without doubt be there? But we've grown up in this world to where we have to do things today in order to prepare for tomorrow. I finally got to the place to where both of my hips would let me bend over and plant some flowers in my yard. I kept falling over on my head, but I finally found a stick to hold on to. Every time I bent over, you know, but I went down, took off down to the nursery. Not where they sell babies, <laughs> but plants. And I said, everywhere I go, I see these pansies. They're beautiful. Now, I don't know why people call weak people pansies. Pansies are the most en enduring flowers you can say amen, Ann. You, I mean, you can have snow on them. They still bloom. But I got down there and I said, I want some pansies. They said, too late, old bean. They're all sold out and we ain't going to have no more next year. I ain't got no pansies. And guess what they had planted all the way around the front of, of, that, of that nursery? Rows and rows of yellow and purple and white pansies. Beautiful. It's like they was aggravating me. Just, just, I had to walk. I said, well, dig some of them up let me have. No, 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 you can't do that. You, 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 it's too late. What do you want? We need some bread. I'm already in the bed with my kids. Go away. Door's already shut. Boom, 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 boom. What do y'all want out there? Noah, let us in. I can't. Open the door. I can't. I didn't shut it. Throw the key out. There ain't no key. God shut to the door. Too late. No admittance. I don't care if you are now ready to plant your pansies. If you don't go when they are ready, you ain't going to get none. And you better be careful if your want to is out of sync with God and your want to wakes up after God's already said, sorry, that's it. Y'all going to break my heart. Don't you dare sit under this ministry and procrastinate and put it off. And I have to stand there in your presence and in God's presence and hear him say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The pansies are here. Get all you want. But one day, it's going to be too late. There was rebellion against the king. And he finally put the rebellion down. And he told him to put up the white flag in the top of the castle. And said, all you rebels, you hated me and you fought against me. I understand. But I want peace now. And as long as this white flag is up there on that pole in the top of this castle, you can come and I'll receive you as my friend. And there'll never ever be anything mentioned or done to you about your rebellion. The white flag's up. But one day, it 
Door's going to be shut. Today is all the time you have. Today is the day of salvation. Be careful, because someday they will not be a tomorrow. Amen. I know we got to get, got to read one more scripture. Second Peter, while we're here, chapter 3. Second Peter, chapter 3. You gentlemen want to come on down and get started? We'll be through in just a minute. Second Peter 3 and verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy manner of life and godliness? The ending of all things, the unbelievable, chaotic destruction of the entire universe. What is it for? It's for you as an individual to relate to God now as how you ought to be. Verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, I can't make you look for them. Sometimes I wish I could take my heart out and stick it in other people and let them feel what it is to love God. Sometimes I wish I could pluck my eyes out and stick them in other people's eye sockets and let them see where they are, but I can't do it. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, listen, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. And whatever you do, the next verse said, don't sin against God's long suffering. Yeah. Scary thing, isn't it? I hope it is. That's what it's meant to be. You tell me, how are you supposed to work out your salvation? Fear and trembling. 